Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always. And today we are joined by Shirley Nang, Senior Vice President of Retail Chain Expressions, Inc. Under her guidance, they have grown from less than 10 stores to well over 100 and counting. Now over 7 million times a year, someone somewhere in the Philippines buys from an Expressions store. Plus, over 84% of their stores are located in emerging and developing cities and municipalities of the Philippines. Shirley, to join us here today to discuss retail past, present, and future, plus what it takes to grow and scale a brick and mortar business. So thank you so much for joining us, Shirley. How are you doing? Hi, Daryl. I'm, I'm doing very good, very well. Thank, thank you. you for inviting me to your podcast. It's interesting that you became interested in the retail trade in the Philippines. I'm really impressed just to say, like you, we talked before, you've done so well through the pandemic and also you've just been consistently growing and growing, obviously year after year. And that a lot of businesses don't make one year, three years, five years. So to be doing this nine years and counting and the, the company around for way more than that. And the fact that you've been in retail and succeeding for 30 years or so is all very impressive. But before we dive in to the nuts and bolts of retail, I want to ask, how did you even get Started. Do you come from a family of business owners? Were were your parents owners of a retail brick and mortar store, or how did you how did you get going? My, my parents, my parents. It's actually my dad who used to run a grocery. He was into grocery stores, but it's just a couple of grocery stores that he went into. But eventually, I became interested when I got an offer. It was actually an offer that I got to join the Sterling Paper group of companies. Mm. So the first foray was to the Sterling Paper. They are actually a manufacturer of the Sterling Notebooks and a lot of other products as well. I wonder if that's what I'm writing on yeah, right now. Yeah. I've got to check. It's yes. Sterling Notebook. Okay. <laughs> yes, I have a, yes, I have a yes. stationary addiction. I don't have any drugs or alcohol addictions, but I do have a stationary, pro stationary problem. <laughs> that would be good for you. Yeah, Sterling has been in the industry for 70 years. So wow. it's really way more than maybe both of our ages combined. Yeah. It has now been in the theory. industry for a other. long time. Yeah. yeah. Checking my other books now for a note. So, anyways, <laughs> I, better, I better focus on the call. So, all right. So you got involved with Sterling in the manufacturing and how did you learn how to grow a retail chain? I, I was moved to the retail business like six months. Within six months of Coming into the Sterling Group, I joined the retail division. It was it started just as a division wherein the company was already operating the retail businesses. It was just a couple of stores because how we started the business, how they started the business, they were invited to just put up a display of the notebooks or the products that they were selling, mm. manufacturing in a department store chain. So they were just asked to just have some sterling products displayed. That's how exact expression started. In fact, when we started the business, the name that we have on the sign is sterling. It's just called the sterling corner. It, it all started with that. Then eventually, uh, we came into the different department stores. It was around 30 years ago where we were invited to be the stationary department in the department stores. So that's how Expressions mm. really started. And eventually, I think management decided to name it Expressions. And we slowly transitioned outside of the department stores and even supermarkets. We used to be inside supermarkets. Mm. So we came out and started to grow by setting up businesses in malls, some in standalone locations. and Aside from Metro Manila, we started growing in the provinces as well. So now you will see an expression store probably in most of the cities in the Philippines. Yeah. So how that's, I just was taking notes that you started with a single location. You, then the company had a strategic partnership where you basically were sharing resources, yes. uh, you're their customers, their, they, their infrastructure and to be in department stores and supermarkets. And then once you guys had established basically a presence and a customer base, and you felt like you knew what you were doing, maybe you did some more research, you started going into mall locations and standalone. How, I feel like we're jumping a little bit ahead here, but how do you pick which cities and which locations to be in, if that makes sense? Like you just open a store and hope for the best? 
No, we do a lot of research. Of course, we get hold of the demographic data. We see the, we look at the statistics. No, it's more of looking at the different, we call it like the FIES, the Family Income and Expenditure Surveys that we look at, mm. the economic conditions, look at NEDAP reports, we look at the different reports and see and try to take a look at what would be the emerging cities or the fast developing locations. So mm. Mm. that's how we go about in our search. So you said FIES, Family Income Expenditure Expenditure and... Survey. Survey. Ah, survey. It might be a little technical. Yeah, it, it yeah, no, might no, that's be a okay. little technical. <laughs> and, and you've been doing this for a long time. This sounds like, obviously, there's a lot of like hard labor that go, has to go into that. And maybe you are yes. buying the data, but somebody has to go knocking on doors. Somebody has to do survey. Is that there, fair to say? Some of this? like um, you know? No, the, the, the report is available with the Philippine Statistics Office. It's right. actually... There are a lot of tertiary reports available out there, but right. sometimes you just have to you know, try to train the data to make it usable for your business. Right. Yeah. Nobody has to go get that data. So although you can get it, yes, yes. it has to be manually created. It sounds like you have to take it. My point that I want to say this is that this sort of data, like you've already given some for the listeners, where you're talking about how do you pick a location to set up a store? You look at F, the family, their income, the expenditures, the family income expenditure survey. That gives you the demographics, what kind of careers they're in. A lot of people now, they can do this on the toilets with their smartphone, right? You can just Google yeah. stuff. You can look up Google Trends. You can do keyword research. There's all sorts of fantastic tools. I'm not saying that it's better than the other, but my, I just wanted to add that in there that for you to get this data, maybe not now, but way when you guys first started expanding, someone had to do a lot of grunt work to get this data and prepare it for you, right? True. Put it yes. in. But now, anybody with a smartphone can access this kind of data to a certain extent. Maybe it yes. may not be accurate, but I just want to point out the power of that because you mentioned how much it was research. You didn't just, because a lot of people, my philosophy is, or my, my experience is a lot of people, they like, maybe they like baking and they're like, some relative says, oh, you should open up a bakery. So they pick a location that they can afford that's close to their house, that's somewhat easy to access. Then they spend months, the logo, the menu, the sign, then they open up and their friends and family make the obligatory purchase. And after that first purchase, they don't have a customer base to serve. And so right off the bat, you were talking about that you would pick locations off of where the people were first. That we're, was where are they? Yeah. Yes. We take note also of the community surrounding it because when we started planning our expansion, we wanted to be where the communities are present so where the of course the cost where there's a strong convergence of the people in the specific locations like of course store, we, like a supermarket was an anchor is an anchor store for a lot of malls supermarket the fast foods yeah the fast, fast food, food the presence right. of all this traffic generators definitely help confirm the viability of the locations that we want to go into yeah, I love that. Yes. I, I mean, that's so smart. I mean, right off the bat, you're, for people, again, the strategic part, you're borrowing other people's customers, other like these fast food chains, the grocery stores, they are the ones that have to bring the people in and you are just trying to set up shop next to them and they're already bringing your customers nearby for you. You just need to be there to put out your sandwich board, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like your yes, hand bills yes. and that. So I just think that's yes, brilliant. Yes. Now in your career, was it that simple? Was it just, oh, we're going to go there? Or were there some challenges no, that you had to face? No, if I can share, because when we when I started in the company, we didn't even have a business development unit. So it was, I was one of the pioneers in the in coming up with the department in order for us to be more strategic in growing the business. Mm -hmm. It was not just simply by an invitation because as you started growing, you will also get invitations from the malls, from the major malls and even the community malls. So it's also, I help pioneer the business development unit. It's not a one-man work, of course. It's a team of people that help me look at this, especially with the support of management. But mm -hmm. I can say that I help pioneer business development. Which is fantastic. So what goes into that? And was it just easy? You're like, I'm going to do this and do this at a world-class level. 
Or were there mistakes made and lessons of learned? Of course, there were mistakes made, of course. I, I would be you know, not really bluffing if I tell you that there were no mistakes <laughs> made. Of course, there's always mistakes that we just want to make sure like when we acknowledge that these mistakes were made, we had to be able to take the right actions immediately mm -hmm. depending on how we work it out with the lessors because most of our units are rented. We, most of the spaces that we do is we just rent a space and put and renovate it then operate it so when we say it's a mistake it could be like the expected traffic or even the committed traffic did not come in therefore the business did not prosper so we simply work out negotiations with the lessors to make sure that if they can do adjustments in how they charge us but eventually the last of course the last option would be, of course, you had to fold up the store. Right, that would right. be the last option, yes. I think during the pandemic, it was really one of the major lessons that we learned that, of course, coupled by the pandemic, so there were some locations in spite of it being in a good location, but it was no longer feasible for us. So we also had to do this painful decisions mm -hmm. of wrapping up our stores. So you have to also take pains in cutting off stores that were not doing okay, not doing well, in order to be able to still sustain, of course, the overall growth of the business. I think that's a really powerful message. There's one, two things I want to tie up because one of the things you were talking about is, you know, how negotiating with the space that's rented. I remember in my hometown, there was a gym, they were called Goal, Good Life. It was like Anytime Fitness. And they were trying to open up one near a mall with my hometown and they had set up a trailer outside and they were renovating the inside and they were signing people up for opening day. And then all of a sudden everything had disappeared. And what I learned when I spoke to someone that worked there was they didn't make their quota for new member signups before opening day. So they, they had a clause in the lease and they just backed out of it because they felt like it wasn't going to be, be successful and feasible. And so you're, t that's what you're talking about now is that the strategy of how you deal with the leasers is important as well, right? The rental space. Yes, that's, definitely. That's definitely yes. it. And there's a bit of diversity yes. involved. In, for they say diversity is stability. By having multiple locations, it's not as sink or swim on does this one specific spot work? The yes. flexibility that comes with that. I think that's really yes. awesome. Speaking of diversity, I would want to say also that, yes, you don't all put your locations in concentrated in a specific territory because there are so many things that happen in the Philippines. Like right now, there are, the mm -hmm. typhoon hit the northern area again this week. You heard that there are a lot yep. of stores that had to close yep. and there were a lot of flooded areas. So it's like now the Visayas or the Minden, the other islands were not really affected. So that's also, it also helps that we don't have concentrated businesses in a single location, right. a single territory. Yes. What would you recommend to someone who's either struggling or starting out with a retail store? In terms of choosing the locations? I, I don't know. I, I know it's a vague general question, but if they've uh, got, if they have a retail store and they're struggling, how do you diagnose? How, is there a process that you go through? How do you diagnose what the problem is? And then what are, what are the top problems and what are the top remedies? Would you say top three of each? Immediately, you try to find out if the business model is something that, that makes sense. Because we try to also see if there's still opportunity for the business because we acknowledge that possibly post-pandemic, there are some businesses that doesn't work anymore. Right. Yes. It's really the business model and how it resonates to the customers. How it resonates with customers. Yeah. I love that. I love that. As it resonates with customers. So, you know, what's the demand? Do they want it? Do they want it? Do they want it? Sense. Yes. In today's day and yes. age, it would be a bad idea to sell fax machines with digital file transfer Definitely. and email. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Right. Those are two great tips. So now, obviously, you talk, let's talk about the pandemic a little bit. So how did you, as a retail store, how do you handle, how did you handle the pandemic? What worked for you guys? During during the pandemic, we, there was a lot of shift for our team members because we are primarily a brick and mortar store. So mm -hmm. that's where we started. And during the pandemic, of course, 
people can't actually go to our stores. So right. we had to reach out to our customers. We actually set up marketplaces. We had our own site. And we were also in the Shopee and Lazada businesses. So we're now, we make ourselves available where the customers are. So the customers are open in Shopee Lazada. Then for the marketplaces, these are also where the Grab Mart, we call it the Grab Mart, Panda Mart. That's where they buy their groceries. Aside from the groceries, yeah. they can actually get, get their supplies from there. So we mm. make ourselves available in the different marketplaces. So it really helped a lot in terms mm. of the accessibility while the customers are not able to physically visit the stores. But in the Philippine setting also, there was a lot of the customers directly contacting our team members. So there mm. is this personal touch that they got wherein they just message our team members on the different social media sites and they actually get to make a purchase within that. There, there's a lot of transactions that go into that. And aside from that, there our team members also went out of their way to reach out to the customers because pre-pandemic, it was easy. People just come into the malls, to the stores. But during the pandemic, we, we had to exert effort to reach out to our customers, our neighbors, mm. our neighboring offices, neighboring industrial parks, even the neighboring schools. So there was also a lot of effort on the part of our team to mm. reach out to our customers. Yes. I love that. So pro proactive outreach. This is yes. like an old school technique where the term drive your business comes from because a lot of people, they want to set up a laptop and just make money while they sleep. But originally the concept, you had, someone had to be there fanning the flames. Someone had to drive the business growth. Someone yes. had to be, yeah. they always say behind every successful business is a man or woman working like a madman, a mad person to keep the flame going and to just feed the fire and to push to drive the business forward. So I love right now that you've just given such, I mean, it's simple, but it's very eloquent advice. You're like, Hey, we had to pivot. We had to get proactive with our outreach. We had to go where the customers were. That meant giving extra customer service, being present on social media, listing on Shopee, Lazada, Grabmart, Pandamart, going where they were. I think that's fantastic. Now, where do you feel the future of retail is? Do you think there's, because I had a friend that just came visiting here from the States. He's an American guy. And I remember we met in Greenbelt and he was so shocked. He said, I feel like I'm in America in the eighties because the mall is so busy and full, but people aren't in malls anymore in the United States. What do you think the future will be in the Philippines? Do you think there's room for both? Do you think the malls are going to decline? How do you see 10 years this, from now? That's a long way to go. The 10 years from now, definitely there's going to be a shift in the way people shop. Because mm. you kept on saying that everything is at their fingertips. <laughs> everything, mm. literally everything. And anything you want to buy from everywhere, from anywhere, you can buy from your phone. So there's really going to be a shift. But the brick and mortar experience will not totally go away. The challenge for us as brick and mortar retailers is to transform also the experience for our customers. When before, it's just simply just coming in, pick up something and leave. Now, there's this challenge for us to continue to experiment with more experiential mm. efforts for them. We actually started our Crafternoon activities within Expressions. Actually, prior to the pandemic, we were already having activities but it's done outside the malls. But we sorry, it's done in the malls. So it's outside the store, out of mm. store activation. We're in. We conduct um learning sessions with the students, and it's done like a class. Imagine having mm. an art class yeah. in the mall. So that, that's how. That's that. That was the activation that we did in prior to the pandemic. There, there's actually okay. an art supply store in the mall across from where we are with a sign outside for art lessons. And they're super busy a few nights a week. So I think that's probably a strategy that they're using. I think that you're hitting a nail on yes. the head right there, that there, there is something yes. to that. People still want to go do things. They want to get out of the house. They want to go do stuff. And they want to talk to be able to interact with people. Yeah. With a live person, yes. Yeah. During the pandemic, we did it online. But it's different. I just yeah. see you 
doing stuff, like trying to follow whatever you're teaching me. Nothing right. beats how I'm doing it. Yeah. Yep. So that was one of the activities that we actually worked on prior to the pandemic. And coming out of the pandemic, we have reactivated also these activities. Yes. I think that's powerful. But that's outside, out of store. But within the store, since it's school season now, so we have not really done a lot of these activities because we're going towards school. But right. we believe that doing efforts for the students, for the child, for the customers to test either test product or learn another skill within learn another skill would really help yeah generate traffic in the stores now i have a question do you guys do any database marketing as retail is that a big part of how you help drive traffic we have our loyalty program we have a loyalty program that mm. is um currently it's still a work in progress we believe that there's a lot of changes that needs to be done so I'm not an ex. I am not the expert here, but I believe that we have enough database of our customers, and we're able to really regularly reach out to them. Hmm. But I believe that there's still more to the to do. database program. Yeah, because that's powerful. But obviously, what you're doing right now is successful. I'm just wondering because if you're on those different like Shopee, Lazada, GrabMart, PandaMart. A lot of different places. Forgive me. Is there you try to centralize? How do you deal with like again, even customer service? That must be challenging. Like having the team follow people on Twitter and Facebook and Pandemart and Grabmart. Is there a way that you consolidate all that, or is it more yes. just trying to yes, have good have, teams? No, our team. We have a good team, but at the same time, we also make use of technology to support us. Yes, there is there's a consolidator, especially for the online marketplaces. Yes, mm. there's a consolidator. Okay. And the inventory is shared. You don't keep another set of inventory. So we activate specific stores to handle the inventory. Got it. That's powerful. Yeah. Yes. That's, that, was, that was one of the other things I wrote down. Can you talk about maybe because you've obviously set up stores in fairly remote locations. The Philippines, you know, some of it is very well developed. You wouldn't know you weren't in New York or Chicago or out of, out, like pick a major city, but other parts are rural and you have to bring your own generators. So how do you handle logistics and supply for that? I wouldn't entirely say that it's really remote because we make sure that um, these are still um, developing cities. Mm. I think what I can say is our logistics team, we actually plan our logistics around Sorry, we plan our expansion in with consideration of the logistics. Mm. We need to say when we want to enter a territory, for example, in Mindanao, the, the farther part of the Philippines, you have to make sure that you're able to put up at least three, three to four stores within that territory that you know it the van can reach it within two hours of each other. So it has to be like that. You cannot just suddenly decide that you wanted to go so far. I think right now there are a couple of stores that are like that. So it's a bit of a challenge to support them in terms of the replenishment of merchandise. And forgive me, but with your merchandise, you guys manufacture all your own merchandise or do you have multiple no, suppliers? No, we have multiple suppliers. We have local manufacturers and local importers. So it's a good mix of the mm. products. Mm. And we're not limited to selling our own products. I need to say... Aside from the Sterling brand, we also carry a lot of the different brands. Mm. I love that. I love it. So really, almost your power is di distribution. It's not that you have a single product. It's that you've got a portfolio of products that perform really well, that pay for you to set up these retail locations. And then that becomes yeah. a distribution network that then allows you to sell and profit from other people creating products people want. Is that part of it? Yes. Like every season, is there like the tickle me yes. doll of your, yes, of your yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love that. So you, your business really does a lot with strategic partnerships. It sounds like you have to work we a do, lot. With, we do yeah. have a lot of very good partners that work with us. Do you have any tips for someone that's trying to work or develop partnerships? Anything that you recommend having done so much for so many years? How do you create win-win relationships? 
it really it's really important that you try to understand of course what the customers want what what a customer would want then work with the suppliers or the vendors to develop or even source products mm -hmm. so some we do sourcing with them we actually give them recommendations and insights i think one that i would really say is we also try to get insights from our customers so we regularly talk to our customers our teams we try to find out what is it that that customers would be looking for that's probably not available in our stores and so it's just a good combination of the basic products I mean to say the basic pen and paper products that you would normally go to a store to buy and also the fancy or the cutie artsy stuff right. that you wanted to also offer to the customers and sometimes they don't even know that they need it <laughs> that they want it yeah right. i heard that you're a notebook person so you're a stationary person yes. you always find the need for it right yes and don't, you go to a store when you try to check it out like there's so many stationaries and notebooks memo yes. pads that I, you buy, need, I buy i buy these pretty ones, ones. And blame yes. I, got, I got my stuff i spent like I, I, one of my cousins once in canada said why do you spend so much on empty notebooks and i said so i can find valuable things to write down in them <laughs> that's why i do it i always like oh what i will do with this so I love that. I really love, I mean, what you're talking about here is really some brass tacks, like fundamental stuff that just seems timeless. You even mentioned that you talk to your customers about future prospects. You've really emphasized a lot in communicating with your customers. How do you do that? Are the staff are mostly just bringing orders? Where do you, how do you collect customer feedback? We have, we have a system in place. It's a program in place where we, we our, cost, our team members actually gather feedback from the field so aside from that we do a lot of interviews with our team members and we try to get them to send feedback to the head office actually it's actually sent to the merchandising office it's the merchandising team who works on the products or the categories that we wanted to expand in growing in providing more offering for customers so you interview customers and staff get yes. feedback from both yes. what a concept that's powerful so do things, how do things evolve? Like your goals today, maybe they're different than your goals were as a company five years ago. So what would you say has changed? What do you think you guys are more focused on now? Not exactly five years ago, but what I can say is previous to our shift, before we were just basically selling school and office supplies and more and novelties and a whole lot more of stuff. But we acknowledge that we have to be more than that to the customers. So we said that expressions, what, who expressions is to the customers. We wanted to be able to empower learning and inspire creativity to our customers. Mm. So empower learning is the tools that we provide would encourage them to continue to learn and by inspiring creativity, that's why the sharing about the crafting one, we even expanded our categories in terms of the arts and crafts and hobbies. Mm. So there are a lot of offerings that we provide from DIYs to raw materials that they can come up with different different crafts and even pursue their own hobbies outside of the computers. Because mm. kids right now, they, they spend a lot of time in, in the computer. So we really like to um, encourage them to be able to pursue their hobbies. Yeah, yeah. Yes. We call that screen sucking because it just latches <laughs> onto their face like an alien. And they, yes. Yeah. Yes. So how do you currently approach like employee training and development within expressions to try to improve and grow with everyone? We have an expressions university that we have set up. Wherein we have a lot of the trainings that we have managed to compile over the so many years. And we also conduct, we call them subject matter experts. So we do a lot of accreditation of our team members. These are the people, the people doing the work. They're not just HR team members. In fact, our HR, we call them people in culture. But the trainers that we have right now is not just limited to the people 
in training. Right. So the trainers that we have right now are mostly the people in operations who do the work mm. themselves. So it's it's across different functions. Of course, the policies, the procedures, policies, we all have them in place. But mm. the training, it's a continuous effort. I we used to say that you have to keep on learning okay. and it's not limited to a training session that you conduct. So we actually encourage them to continue to learn within within their teams, in their meetings, in their even in their regular huddle sessions. Mm-hmm. We have regular huddle sessions, one in the morning, one in the evening, for all of the stores. It's every store has such a program where in it's still a learning session for them. So they mm-hmm. will learn different things mm-hmm. from product knowledge to how to deal with customers, to their behavior, towards leadership because we mm-hmm. also say that everyone is a leader mm-hmm. and they're also all given an opportunity to grow in the organization. So mm-hmm. not limited to just learning the technical or the, the work per se, but for them right. to grow as individuals. I believe like, that's how we are able to grow our team members. And how, what kind of skills or behaviors do you feel are important for them to develop and improve? There are like as, as basic as the C, planning, leading, organizing, uh, but to the more complicated, it's really strategic thinking, negotiation skills, because on an everyday thing there's a lot of negotiations that they do with the customers so i'm basically talking about the people on ground so this is right. mainly the people who deal with the customers every day mm-hmm. so they also get trainings in terms of social media we do a lot of the marketing trainings that we do a lot of the discussions with them in terms of familiarizing learning social media mm-hmm. as we all know that it's not limited to marketing, handling social media. So right. in a way, we have tried to equip our team members to do more than, to do, to go beyond what they started with. Because normally when they just enter as a sales associate, what do they do? They just sell. But now it's beyond just selling. Mm. For them, it's to the point of establishing a relationship with the customers. Mm-hmm. Mm. And pages you're gonna have to send me some notebooks i'm running out of paper over here <laughs> uh, <laughs> i'm just I'm kidding, I'm just sure kidding. now what do you feel are some of the habits that have helped you most on your path to success and getting to where you are if there's one one habit is what i can say is listening listening to our team members i'm based in the head office in fact, right now, I'm no longer on top of the operations team. I just mm. transitioned. Yes, I just transitioned. But in my, if I can say, like almost more than 30 years of experience working with the operations team, one of the key learning that I got is really be, being able to listen to them. Mm. Mm. Listening mm. is one of the most critical Two things, two two keywords that I can share. It's empathy Mm. and respect. I want to be able to listen to them and take actions or work on solutions together with our team members. Powerful. I think that's super powerful. Of course, respect for everybody. You give respect, you get respect. I think that's a really important thing. Yes, that's basically, yeah. And are there, do you, when you look at other retails, obviously here you work for a retail company, but you also are a shopper yourself. And when you go around and see other stores and go to different brick and mortar places, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you feel you see retail businesses making? I would notice, like, please in, just try to recall my visits. One of, of course, I not mentioned the store, but it seems like the people in the store are too busy with their own thing. They don't even bother, yes, to, you know, acknowledge the customers. It seems, I'm not sure if, because coming out of the pandemic, the um, they would have lesser people in the store. Therefore, mm-hmm. they might be too busy with the things that they're asked to do, that they 
are not able to properly acknowledge the customers. Right. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Customers. Yeah, it's a big one. Yes. People, business is a group of people helping another group of people, and they do it with a product or service. And that, that human element, I think, is still really important. People, some automation is okay, but too much is no good. And there really has to be someone. People do business with people at the end of the day. All things considered equal, people want to do business with their friends. Even if things are a little unequal, people still want to do business with their friends. But if the staff aren't even noticing you when you go into a store, then you might just go somewhere else. That's a good point. That's a really good point. Shirley, you've given such great info. This is lots of, I've got a couple of pages of notes here, two, three, four. I think people listening to this call may want to go back and listen to it a couple of times. Now, I want to ask you though, what do you feel, we only got a couple more questions. I want to be respectful of your time. What do you feel are some of the most effective or productive traffic strategies in retail? Is it like the dancing thing outside? Is it <clears throat> having a neon sign? Is it glass windows? What would what would you say? I think for the brick for our formats, I think coming up with a good yeah, we call it a show window presentation. Still works. Yes, still it works. still works so much because people will first see what you have to offer from mm. there before they decide to go in. Of mm. course, there are a lot of times they already intend to go in, but if they do not have any plans of going in, having a show window that really impacts them would encourage them to go in. Yeah. The dancing, yes, helps, but you can't do it all the time. <laughs> yes. That makes sense. In I guess the show window is almost like a giant ad. Yes, Ooh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. That's the first thing they see. Yes. Yep. Before, you always have a guard, right? You Previously, you would have a guard in front of your store. But nowadays, it's not like that. And you want a scary guard because that's what the guard's job is. But that may not be the best thing yes. to put in front of people. <laughs> yes, yes. A guy with a shotgun. And the people that don't know in the Philippines, a lot of, a lot, not all, but a lot of guards are armed. <laughs> yes, yes. And when they enter, they try to like score through your things. Remember? Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's yeah, how yeah. they do it before. I like know. You're trying to say, what is it that I have inside me, this bag that yeah. they, they want to like try to use their stick and try to score through it. Yeah, I'm an ex. I'm not Filipino, so I try to avoid confrontations with guards and police and all that, of course. But I remember I went into this one mall. I had to do. A, I did a Facebook Live because they were using the metal detector thing, like the hand waving yes. one. And so but, it was alarming. It, yeah, it's, it was an be, alarm. Be, you think they were scanning a barcode for everybody? Because and I, I just I was like, you know how that's supposed to work? Do you know what that? Because if it beeps, you're supposed to investigate what made it beep. They're like beep, just like waving people in. So it just made me, made me laugh. Yeah, Shirley, this has been great. You've got given a lot of really good, like wholesome. I don't know if wholesome is the right word, but just like fundament, doing the fundamentals really well at a high level. Listening to the people, going where the people are, innovating quickly, research, collecting feedback. As a, you said, you even that you have a system for collecting feedback from customers and staff listening, empathy, respect. You talked already about daily huddles. You're teaching your staff. It sounds like everybody works for marketing and sales now at the company. Not in the sense of yeah. trying to sell, but you're saying that even the sales reps, it's not just about selling. I equip. Yeah. Pardon? You equip them. Yeah, you equip Every them day, yes. to communicate. And so it just yeah. sounds like there's some great stuff here. People may want to listen to the call again. I, before we wrap up, is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? No. Just no. maybe just one thing that I want to share. Yeah. Or yeah, I, I just want to share with you that one of the things, because of course this thing I prepared for any closing message, I would like to share that for us, it's really taking care of our people hmm. to take care of our business, hmm. so taking care of your people to be able to take care of your business. So that's, I think that's what I can share as to wrap up I th yeah. how we do about the business yeah. yeah i think that's i think that's really empowering a lot of people used to treat staff as replaceable a lot of them yeah. like that. Yeah. but now i everyone i've talked to since the pandemic has said hiring talent has been hard 
and more yes. and more companies are having to train up. And it sounds like you already yes. have an advantage for the fact that you take care of your people. You put them first. That sounds fantastic. So that's a great, that's a great addition. Shirley, thank, thank you so you. much for joining us thank here today. You. If people want to reach out, if they want to get in touch, if they have questions or anything, how, how should they contact you? I have all my contact details with you. Feel free to share it. Okay. Sure. So you can, yeah. they, can you so you much, on, they can look you up on LinkedIn. There's S H yes. R L E Y N G Nang. Shirley Nang Expressions Inc. is where she works. Do you want to give out your email, your personal email, or just link? Um, email is okay. Email's email okay? is okay. Yes. Right. yes. Okay. NG underscore S H R Y L at yahoo.com. Oh, no. I know. I one? can send you my email credentials. I just send you my other, the, the one that you're writing to. Ah, oh, let me check. Yes. Let me check that. Yes. Let's get that. We'll edit this and put the right one in. Okay. Oh, wait. Okay. Uh, we're using your expressions one. Do you want the expressions? Yes, one? yes. Ah, okay. Yes. Sorry. So email at expressions. S H yes. at expressions.com.ph. That's S H N G at expressions.com.ph. Okay. Okay. That's the one to check out. Shirley, okay. thank you so much. I know you've got thank a you. company, lots of people. Thank you for coming and sharing with us. Thank you, Dariel. Appreciate your time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.